Okay. Everybody hear me first of all? But if you want reference to this data, we definitely, most of it came from the Ministry of, of uh, Health and uh, SS. Yeah. Yeah. Social yeah. Service, yeah. Uh, which I've engaged with in the past. Uh, a lot of it comes from the New England Journal of Medicine and from the Biomedical Engineering uh, Literature. Um, it's very informal, so if, again, if you have a question, just raise your hand, we'll stop, we'll sort it out, okay? For sure. This is where I'm from. Uh, it's part of the attraction of me coming to Namibia was we have very similar geographies in many ways. Uh, we're a lot higher than you in altitude, so we have a much greater seasonal difference. I come from an agricultural family that tries to make a living off beef cattle. And we need about 50 hectares per cow calf to make a living. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. So we're arid. We rely on rain and we rely on snow, which you don't have. Snow to us is just rain in the bank. <laughs> and so we're at the, at, the, at the whims of all markets. It's enough to support one family. I went another direction, so my sister runs the ranch. And this is not unlike uh, the kind of land you'll see. This is in the dry season. And then when the rains come, you'll have a, a half a meter to a meter of grass, and that's your product is processed through a beef cow. Pretty simple to what you guys have here. So that was another attraction for me to come to Namibia. But you do have an ocean not far away. We don't. We're a big country. Uh, the family ranch is about 20,000 hectares. So you can do the math. And we use horses to work the cattle. A lot of folks are now using ATVs or four-wheel drive. We just use horses. But that's not why you came to see. This is a homesteader shack on the ranch. Long ago, the government gave if you had 80 hectares and you built something on it, the government gave you the land. We're all immigrants. Just remember that. I have a lot of titles, and this is the title of the talk. But the titles are not important to me. It's, it's what we can share and what we can do. Uh, the, the most important thing I've done recently is this last one, when I was chosen by the Obama administration to be the senior science advisor to the State Department in the U.S. It was quite an honor to do it. I was humbled and I was overwhelmed because I was picked by the Academy of Science, the Academy of Science, Science and Engineering and Medicine, to do the job by Obama's group. And then I came under Trump, who is anti-science. So it was an interesting job to say the least. But he couldn't fire me because I was not his employee. I was an employee of the Academy of Science. And so he, I don't think he could read what I wrote in anyway. <laughs> That's a separate point. Uh, today, this is a, an engineer to me. I met him in Eastern Namibia not long ago, and he humbled me because he built this. He built this. I couldn't build this. I couldn't build it. Here it is. How clever. He could steer it in the sand. So I said, well, this guy's going to be a great engineer. I hope I haven't followed him since. I have no idea what has happened to him. But I hope he's had some opportunities. And that's why I'm here, is to try to get opportunities for people as best I can. Kiwi shoe polish. He doesn't even have shoes on. Well, we need some definitions. And these definitions are thrown around, and I'll use them kind of loosely as I talk about clinical and biomedical engineering. Under the umbrella of biomedical engineering are different types of bioengineers apply engineering principles. That's the tools of science and math with a dollar sign on them, giving them value, right? To biological systems. If you brew beer, you're a bioengineer. You're using biological systems to produce crop. If you're a farmer, you're a bioengineer. If you're a rancher, you're a bioengineer, and you go through the ruminant. Now, you can be more specific. This is kind of what I claim to be as a biomedical engineer. I apply bioengineering principles, the ones of above, to medical systems. It's more of an academic thing. You'll see some of the products today I'll show you. Uh, we design, we model, we predict, we see relationships in science. But it's generally academic. It doesn't have to be, but it generally is. Biotechnology is a new one. 
This applied engineering and material science principles to cellular molecular biology. This is a huge, big field. Come on in, folks. Not to worry. It's a huge, big, exploding field because it's on the nano level. I don't do much of it. But then now in the United States, if you apply for a grant through the National Institute of Health and you don't have a biotechnology component, you're not going to get funded. Because they want to know what's going on at the DNA level. Okay? There is a classic new style in biotechnology. Does that make sense? I believe so. Yeah. And it's, it's just repetitious hardware doing repetitious things at the nano level. Here's what I think we need to focus on, and this is generally under the umbrella of bioengineering, that's clinical engineering. And this is what this country needs. And I'll give you evidence to that. It's applied biomedical engineering principles, this line, to clinical and hospital arenas. They fix, manage, work with hardware. Got it? And the stethoscope will take you a long, long ways, Paul. But that's about it. it. All it is is a rattle beat. It listens to gurgles and shakes and rattles. We can make images of this. And the last thing is I think also what this country needs is health technology management. I'll make a case for that. Apply management principles to clinical engineering. So it's this, but in a managerial fashion. And it's very fashionable nowadays for an engineer to get four years training as a certified engineer and then become an MBA and get health technology management. They run hospitals, they run districts, both in the public and private sector. Can everybody hear me? I'm getting in your face. <laughs> okay. So we got these definitions now. And the two that I want you to weigh together are these two. All right? This is omnipotent, it's everything. It's the history of man. So why do we get in this profession? I hope this is why most people get into profession. In this particular case, we get into this profession as engineers to minimize morbidity and mortality. Morbidity is cheap. I mean, sorry, mortality is cheap. Morbidity is expensive in my country. We over-service. When you die, you don't cost any more money to the public health system. You follow me on that? When you have morbidity, then it's chronic, then it costs a lot to the public health system. We try to oops, let me go back. We try to increase quality of life years, not just lives. You follow me on that? Now, if you write a grant looking at therapeutic interventions and they're looking at endpoints like death, they don't look at death anymore. They look at how well you die. If you were mobile, if you were independent, if the treatment, whether it's pharmacological or physical, does it change outcomes? And the outcomes are often measured in quality of life years. Because in my country, which is going through a very difficult time, in my country, we spend about 90 cents on our dollar on the last year of life. Not the first year, the last year. So the quality years are important. And our goal also is to fairly distribute cost effective care and education, distribution of services. And then lastly, we all want this we all want increased public wellness. I'll show you that and get there. Social justice and fairness. Easy to say, really hard to do. Everybody with me right now? <clears throat> well, please remember, I want you to remember this. I tell physicians this all the time. A large part of biomedical engineering and clinical engineering is imaging diagnostic. X-rays, MRIs, all that sort of thing. But I remind my engineer friends and students and my clinical friends and students, that diagnostic medicine doesn't cure anything. It guides the cure. Follow me on that? We spend a ton of money on it. Nice to know images, but do they change outcome? So, diagnostic healthcare guides, but never directly prevents or cures diseases. Personal choices, Evidence-based therapies and vaccines can. They not necessarily do, but they can. And COVID's been a, an example of that. You won't see any hero stories of the of the of the immunologists that put together the vaccines for COVID-19. They won't be on primetime TV. But they are the heroes in my book. 
And moms and dads are healers too, by the way. So, how do you die? How effective is healthcare? This is from data from the New England Journal of Medicine. Lee Sheffer's work, Bill Welk, published science, public health official. I believe this stuff. I'm not sure why we die or we become disabled. It depends largely on your parents. You've got to pick the right parents. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hard to do. Or should we get into this? We, we, go, we could go in depth on all of this. And where and how you've been. It's your responsibility, as well as medicines. And this is some hard data that sort of shaped up the world, but then it went away because it, it's so hard to change the inertia of the system right now. Here's why you die. Prematurely. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine, to me, the finest of all medical journals. The lens is a kind of a separate. Science and science and science. But here's you got to pick your parents. 30% of your outcome will depend on your genetic predisposition. It's not your fault. Your behavior is about 40% of your outcome. Social circumstances, where you live, environmental toxicity, small portion. If you live in a tornado zone, you might get a tornado. Or hurricane. Or drought. Physicians don't like to see this because guess what? In America, this is America's data. Healthcare is about 10% of your outcome. We kind of pump our chest and say we're really great. Are we? In proportion to others. I'll be happy to show you the raw data. Well, this is why you die in America. This is about 10 years old. It doesn't include COVID. Why do you die in America? Smoking, obesity, and inactivity. It's kind of happening here, isn't it? We're getting bigger. We're not getting very healthy. I'm not preaching it. I'm just showing you that. We <laughs> disagree. Disagree. It's pretty a blurry glimpse of the obvious. In America, we are big. We are big. Our cars are big. We're paying five dollars a gallon for gas. That's about what a dollar a liter. That's 15, 16 rands per liter. And we're complaining, but we're driving a giant kiloton truck to go where we should walk. We're drug induced guns. Oh, that's going up big. Motor vehicles, alcohol, sexual behavior. They're the big players. How would you rearrange this in that maybe? Anybody want to take a wild guess? Raise your hand. How would you? Which one would you up? Motor vehicles. Yeah. Yeah, you got a lot of trauma here. No, we see the argument that people use to ride big trucks is that it's safer, which is true. The physics is in their side. A big truck hits a little truck. The little truck loses. You decelerate far less quickly than a big truck. Well, what could we do about this? Well, this is the way I've looked at it in my travels and working around the world. Is that healthcare in developed countries, there's a high cost for a low gain. We put a lot of bucks and energy into changing this morbidity platform very much. Don't tell me. We don't have a lot of infectious diseases. We do here. In low resource, this is irrelevant. This is entirely irrelevant in developing low resource countries. Where we're, I think we can get a high gain for low cost. We can switch that pie shape thing I gave you around a little bit. Medicine can do a bigger bang for the buck. And the quality of life and longevity of life. I promise I'll get the engineering in a minute. But I want to set the scene. Fair enough? Well, this is my version of reality, and I think it's supported by the data. Now, read me through. It's a very busy slide, and I apologize for that, but we got we got to get through this. Worldwide morbidity and mortality are caused equally by overconsumption and underconsumption. 20 years ago, 40 years ago, people that underconsumed died and had higher morbidity and mortality rates than people with large consumptions. 
Now people with large consumptions are equal with unconsumption, underconsumption. By personal choices and circumstances. Follow me on that? We're getting there. Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken will win. <laughs> in my view, and in many others, under uh, with under consumption largely affects the diseases are the issue. And overconsumption largely chronic disease. Any argument there? No. With high mortality more morbidity mortality and poor education birth rates go up. Isn't that ironic? It's true. I learned, I got all the data from the State Department. This is very, very true. You have more children because you think you'll have more. People take care of you, you'll have more income down the line. With low morbidity mortality, birth rates go down. Cool. In my version, cool. Management families. I wasn't telling you what to do, it's just telling you to be smarter, mm -hmm. be fair about it. And then lastly, there's strong evidence suggests the decrease in mortality and mortality, empowering women. That's the number one thing you can do across the world to improve the human condition. When I was growing up, we didn't even think. Empowering women to work, to vote, to make their own decisions, to choose their own birth rates. If you do that, everything goes better. But do we do it? Well, we try. So, the empowering women, educating the masses, will stabilize their population state. And I'd be, hard, be happy to sit down on our table and show you that. It's available online, by the way. So, what about Namibia? Everybody knows more about this, Namibia knows more about this than I do. In German settled, mostly Lutherans. Yeah. And that's kind of interesting because Lutherans say, be there at 3 o'clock, they're there at 3 o'clock. <laughs> I've been in India and in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And you say 3 o'clock or Brazil, if it's a pretty day and the beach is clean, boy, they see you. They show up. They show up. Then you have. South Africa gained it in the World War I, apartheid. We have another name for apartheid. And Paul and I, we were talking about this today. We have Jim Crow. You ever heard of Jim Crow? Yes. It's the same thing. It's just a milder version. You agree, Paul? Milder version? I don't know. I just, I didn't see a black person until I was eight years old. Because the, Me the Mexicans on the far southwest, they're majority Hispanic. I took a train from... New Mexico to Florida, and I got off the train and I saw a sign colored only. I had no idea what that meant. We're getting better. We've got a long ways to go, but we're getting better. I happen to think personally, I've just said Obama's one of the most interesting men in the world. I don't always agree with it, but I, I think he's a solid person. Namibia got your independence size about 2.4 million, about the same size population as my state. Our state's a third the size. 84% uh, is native. It's a stable democracy. Is that true? I hear, I've seen people doing this. That's the thing about democracy. You never use really easy consensus. It's a messy business. But this is admirable. Is that true? I don't check this. It's around 85, 90%. This is what the World Bank says. This is what USAID thinks. I see university kids that cannot read and write to my state university. I brought three and maybe in students over there to study, become engineers, also play rugby, win championships. Top students. They're far ahead of what we see coming through the doors. You should be proud of them. I just need to defend from that bridge. That literacy rate. That literacy rate? Yeah. yeah. It's going to depend on language. It depends on language? Yes. Yeah. We've kind of got a common language at home. But in my state, we speak equally Spanish. Not equally, but it's, it, we combine the two. 
como no. Is that right? That's the last data I got up there. 10K. Our state is 28K. Now, California is probably 48K for geographically dependent. But your Gini index is what tells me a lot. Does anybody know what that means? Distribution of wealth? If it's zero, everybody makes the same. I call that Scandinavian. When it's high, there's a big disparity. That is a tough nut to crack. That's going to take generations and patience and goodness. Uh, we're getting that way in the United States. So that's setting the, the table right for you. Now tell me if I'm wrong here. I've been in both. It's called public and private sector. There's about a thousand private positions that serve about uh, a fifth of a million. Right? Well, by the way, in the U.S. and in developed countries, it's about 1.2 positions per thousand. And I'll jump ahead and I'll tell you there's about one for 20,000 biomedical engineers or clinical engineers. That's the ratio we're shooting at. Right now, the, bio, the ratio of bioengineers and clinical engineers in Namibia is zero. <laughs> That's an easy number to understand. You can multiply it all you want, but coefficients in front of it is still bloody zero. There's, I work with these folks, uh, 2,200 uh, public positions serve about 200 white and black. Disease and poverty, obviously. We have been to all of these. We have been to all of these. Points of care clinics, 14 regional, and two central hospitals. They didn't count Katsuchuda Hospital as a central hospital. I've worked there. It is a hospital under stress. The last count I saw, I put this thing here one CAT scanner, one MRI, two ultrasound devices in the central hospital. Again, getting back to that statement, diagnostic equipment never changed out. It just guides you down. But it's an indicator of quality of service. And searching the literature at the, at, at the publications coming out of the Ministry of Health and Social services. This is what all I could find in terms of medical technical people. Was 15 and mostly unfilled. They don't have the expertise. Raise your hand if you disagree. Sorry, can I just ask the source of the information from the previous slide? You can get all this on the, the stuff that comes out of the ministry is, is online. The strategic plan. Yeah, I have it. It because oftentimes it's not updated. It could be. It's the best I can do. So maybe uh, because I know that the Treasury Health Care Directorate is responsible for that, mm -hmm. and those numbers do need to get rid of the Well, that's good. I'm happy to talk to We'll cross paths on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, historically, the medical training team from South Africa. Russia has been a big hitter. Right now, I'm frankly not a big fan of Russia. So we've got an exchange program with them. I'm sure there are fine docs coming out. I was here when this happened, and I was really happy to see it happen. The med school, it's a magnificent facility. I've taught there, I've worked there. I'm, you should be very proud of it. It's doing well. First graduates came out in 2015 and 44. I think that's kind of what they're averaging now, more or less. Um, many assigned to district hospitals. The quality uh, control suggests they're all performing well. Getting, and by the way, your ratio is one half of physician per thousand or one physician per 2,000 population. So it's, it's getting there. But there's a great demand for clinical engineers and health technology management. And I'll give evidence to that. It's a fine facility. Most everybody's been there, I assume. It's first class. It beats us in New Mexico. 
in terms of hardware and facility. But you have to put the right people in. Happy faces, microscopes, that's always a marketing tool. <laughs> For boys, it's a marketing tool because there's just as many girls as boys, which is a good deal. This is a district hospital. I'm sure you've seen them. I've been to all of them, surveying them for needs. I can't remember. I think it's in the south. Does it look familiar? They all kind of look the same, as you would expect, because, because why not? It's standardized things. And they're, I think they're, they're doing the best they can. They usually have two nurses there. I'll get into that in a minute. This is the inside, tidy, well done. The equipment, not much, but you don't need it. There's the staff, one of the staff. They have the traveling guy on the right. Your right is a Zimbabwe trained physician. He comes there once a, once a month for one day. And then you have the nurse on the side. Usually there's two nurses there. I hope I don't have more experience with your rural medicine than you have you had yourself. I don't live here. <laughs> nice guy. And by the way, with all due respect, he, he, he says his paycheck comes late. <laughs> but he does the best he can. Zimbabwe. This is the sign outside. It's fairly typical. This was done in, like, with help from your previous colleagues at WPLI. It comes once a month. Three languages. Four? Four? Is there? <laughs> that tells you how much I can speak. <laughs> and I, I kind of like this. Bushmen get a free, they get free medical. <laughs> Everyone else has to pitch it. I like that. You have to have skin in the game. You can't get every, nothing comes for free. You, you kind of agree on that? It shows that you're committed. You don't come just to say hello. I think we should learn this in the States. The Bushman at zero, that's $250 for a consultation. Uh, that's your old dollars. That's about twenty US. But this is quite a That's a good one. Does it seem high? Yeah. I'm sure. I would say it's probably ten and a half because they probably don't enforce it. Well, that's private. That would be private. Yeah. Yeah. And then everywhere I go, I see piled up equipment. It's not working. It's not working. Clinical engineers walk around with a multimeter. Anybody know what a multimeter is? Yeah. It measures voltage, current, ohms. Does the darn thing got power? Does it? What is broke down? You can do it. I can train all of you to do it in half a day. It would solve 50% of your problems. But when it breaks down, they just walk away. And they find a place to store it. And often it's, it's donated by Finland or Germany or US or whatever. So we talked about the medical side, let's talk about the engineering. Historically trained in South Africa, of course, it's difficult for them to get in. Sam and I were in that battle. We, we, we put the engineering program together here at News to get a modified Bachelor of Science of Engineering. Credited. Minimal native students. The highest level was a B tech, a polytech. First BS was ME, AA in mining, and when I entered about 500, 95% on government loans. Graduated about 50, is that about right, Sam? Uh, yeah. Mostly employed, mostly. Mines. The mines pick up most. Fair enough. I could not find one single biomedical engineer, clinical engineering training in any way. Show me one. 
And oh, also, my, I have a question. We'll get to them, okay? Hang on. So, this is what motivates me still. I have failed the first round. Sam suggested it. I got a letter. I worked on Sam with that. So, the Minister of Permanent Secretary of everyone knows Chalma. Powerful man. He's a gas station guy now. Okay. He's also a, a chemist, a PhD chemist. Yeah. You can talk to him. The subject of that, I can show it to you. I have a hand, copy of it. I got it. It's all official with a with a animal on it, on it, all of that. They said request for clinical. So I took them at their word. Request for clinical engineering training. I'm like, okay, I can do that. And here's what it said: Well, the greatest challenge to the Ministry of Health and Social and Problem uh, is facing is the lack of biomedical field engineers, engineering techniques, and general management degree. Quote unquote. So I said, let's do something. We can do something. There's a lot of models overseas. I'm familiar with one. Let's see if we can do something. The current, this is the final state. Establish a training program for clinical engineers and engineering technologists as long-term solution to this challenge. The challenge is real. Well, this was eight years ago. We were going to go to Cape Town. I mean, people like to go to Cape Town. You know, it's a big city <laughs> town. I'd rather stay here than go to Cape Town. Six months of classroom hospital. It's at the renowned, it's not Stellenbosch, but it's the University of Cape Town. That will do. And they had a program in health, maintenance, technology, postgraduate, diploma. They're all set to go. They're going to come back and work. Cost about three to four thousand US dollars to go there for the year to get this training. They're already engineers, certified engineers. They're going to go get the training in health technology management. And we didn't get this money. Then I have a real job elsewhere. Sam was running the program. It lost, then COVID happened. So along, we had to fill in that time. So I'm going to share this with you because this is part of what I want to release out on the hospital. POCUS means point of care ultrasound. I don't know, anybody familiar with it? A little bit? It's pretty cool. We completed, we, we with help from students from the US, we completed analysis of all the little district hospitals and this and that. The site got, we, we completed, I'm sorry, we, we completed the analysis. Two central and four, 14 regional hospitals, 16 data points. We went on to five point of care, small rural clinics, 70 data points. We got data, we surveyed what their needs were, what their staffing was. Uh, how do they die? How do they triage? If I understand triage, you keep them or you send them. You treat them or you don't treat them. We reported this data. We came back with the understanding that about 80% of the imaging requirements could be done there on site. And I'll show you how in a minute. The highest need was obviously OB, infectious diseases, and trauma, and especially lung damage to the TB and now C19. So the landscape's changing a little bit. We were successful in doing this. I say modestly successful. But we tried hard. So now we have a new proposal that we're going forth. And we're going to ask you to comment this when we uh, Sam's going to talk, talk a little bit about that. Train and deploy 30. That's one third of what you need if you go by the ratio of clinical engineers per province. So we'll set up on 30. Because you have a more consolidated system. And again, this is in the public sector. <coughs> if private sector people want to join us, you bet. So we want to get that done by 2026. Deploy to train handheld, robust, robust, low wattage, multi use, inexpensive point of care, smartphone based. And I'll show you what that is in a minute. It's revolutionizing the clinical exam. We're going to put them in clinics. I'll show you that in a minute. So our approach is going to take one factor in. Not me, I'm too old. You need a young, robust person to come. I'll help out starting in. But we need one faculty member 
the nurse is going to have to come up with it to do this. But a PhD practical professor at Bell Medical Engineering. We're going to call, we're going to create a concentration within a concentration within the mechanical, electrical, and maybe more degrees. In other words, the person will come out with an engineering degree, but they'll have a concentration of studying biomedical. That does not keep them from working at the mines. You follow me? If we give them a biomedical degree, that's going to confine them more specificity than they need right now. So they can do both. It kind of makes sense to us. There's lots of models elsewhere to do this. And then eventually it will probably become a master's program after you finish your engineering degree. And you know something. You have some skills. There'll be four required courses right now in a senior project that will be worked with the School of Medicine. It has to be run with the School of Medicine. It has to be a practical, hands-on, deliverable, done well. Anatomy and physiology, have the physiology for engineers. I love teaching this to engineers because they gobble it up. Now teaching engineering principles to life scientists is a little bit harder because you have the nasty word calculus. <laughs> calculus is the easiest thing in the world. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. He's a physician. It's how things are shaped. We're the only things that make things square. The world is not square. It's the rate of change of things in the world. It's just you have to believe in infinity to understand calculus. That's pretty cool. So it's fun to do. Uh, biomechanics, that will be part of the BME, the biomedical part. It will be biomechanics and biosensors, that's part. That's in the realm of biomedical engineering. It will be clinical instrumentation. How does the darn thing work? How do you fix it? What is its temporal resolution? What's its spatial resolution? And what's its power resolution? It's very simple. You just go by the rules. And if you have a lot of terms in a relationship, you throw out the ones that don't have much significance. You linearize if you can. And then lastly, it'll be a managerial thing, health technology management. This will be hardcore courses, and their senior project will be done through this school of medicine. That's our first cut. That's the best we can do right now. And there's lots of models. <coughs> So, we'll also get, uh, get point of care equipment acquisition through General Electric HP Butterfly. That's a, right. They'll, you know, these outfits like to call themselves Google, and they like to call themselves uh, Amazon. So, they, this outfit that makes really good equipment is called Butterfly. We get grant, we're searching for grants from the Gates Foundation, WHO, USIID, where I know well. You can say forever to buy the equipment and put it in place. So every graduate that comes out of medical school has one in hand in place for the stuff. And you'll see why in a minute. And we're working with, with these people here. I didn't write this book. I'm not pushing the book. I just say it's global health and biomedical engineering. She's a lovely person, Rice University. She's on board with us to help us see all this. You can look around. To go to TED, TED Talk. You guys familiar with TED Talks? Yeah. yeah. So there's Chris Hunter. He was my liaison. He was uh, chief of internal medicine, I think, and physiology. He's gone to Georgetown and global health there. He's moved back. The family wanted to move back. Great guy. He's using this as a large unit right here. And he's examining this person. What's really nice about examining people, and maybe mostly, not all, is they're skinny. <laughs> <laughs> you can see right, you can have great resolution, you can see moving parts of you. You can see the heart, you can see burrow, you can see disease tissue. You, if American walks in, you go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is great guy. He's moved on. He's been great help. This is a little dark, but this is how side that now watch that transducer. That's the transducer attached to the spark Now they just automate spark fluids now. 
that's the size of it. That's the ultrasound unit with your smartphone. One transducer, one frequency throughout the body. You can use it. It replaces hundred thousand dollar consoles. And I can train a nurse practitioner how to get ninety percent of use out of it in a week. And you put it in your pocket. Now back home, the radiologists are screaming, "We don't need you anymore." We can triage people with imaging capacities under the coconut tree. Costs about a thousand bucks. A stethoscope will cost a good stethoscope. You got one for two hundred. That's cheap. But this stethoscope will cost you three or four hundred bucks. This. this allows you to look at the back. This I took a constituent hospital in two, three years ago. All of those machines don't work. Sixty to eighty thousand dollar machines, not them. They're probably donated by like, for, for well meaning. Who knows? They sit in the hall. Now, go, remember what I said diagnostic medicine clearing plan? No, but it sure gives you good guidance. So I think a biomedical engineer, a clinical engineer on site would not let this happen. And more importantly, they'll go to decision makers and policy makers and money bags and say, that bright, sprinkly new machine is great, but you don't need it. It's not going to change outcomes. Not in this arena. I thought we'd have that just for research purposes. So, be up to date. The challenge remains. This is from the five, this is, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is from the, the five year, 17, 18 to 2021, uh, five year strategic plan. These are quotes I from in the technological part of the document. These I quote. Unreliable, outdated technology, like requires technology equipment, and skill deficit, and maintenance, absence, score, network. Is this true? I think it's kind of true. And I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. I'm just being observation. So maybe we can help. If someone knows basic engineering principles and apply to these decisions to keep this stuff running. And they're not by it if you don't need it. And technologies move beyond this. I'm confident that your youth can do it. That's me and my last class one. I'm confident that it's not a problem. I'll be leaving here and going there. And I hope you guys figure it out. <laughs> we got our own problems taken in my Thanks for coming. <laughs>